The number you have dialed is not in service at this time. Welcome to Spotlight on the Arts. I'm Patrick Cristiano, your host, the publisher of TheaterLife.com, a website for theater buffs in New York City and the Hamptons. And we cover Broadway and off-Broadway theater. And I'm coming to you from the LTV studio where I have a special guest today, Michael Longacre, who is an artist that lives out here in Sagaponic. Uh, he's transported himself and he has an interesting journey that he has been on as an artist. It has taken him a lot of different places and he's going to share his process with us. Okay. Welcome. Thank you. <laughs> well, your process and your journey is what I meant <laughs> a little bit. Both of, of some of the whatever you'd like to tell us about it. Okay, but well, are we going to start with we're gonna, an image, or are we going to start with that I'm from Texas and grew up in Austin? Let's start with that you're from Texas and you grew yes, up in Austin, because I, I think that's really interesting. And I didn't, did I tell you I'm from Texas? You did. Oh, you, I did tell uh, you, so let's Fort Worth, it. right? Let's stay focused on you, yes. Uh, well, you, you left sooner than I did, so you, I... You actually grew up there. I did. I grew up there. I went to college. I went to art school, the University of Texas. Um, art school is actually uh, a, a national uh, reputation. Um, and then as soon as college was over, I moved to New York City because I had been here once and um, confirmed that it was my true home and that somehow I'd been kidnapped and <laughs> <laughs> taken to Texas. <laughs> I, always, I always feel like I had a past life and it was in the West Village. And whenever I was in the West Village, something I just felt at home, like I never did any place else in the world. It's did you feel like that about New York? Yes, but I also feel that way about the Hamptons. So uh, it's one of the oddest things to me, um, having been out here now for 20 years, was being out here and having this sense of returning to a home place that is not even slightly like central Texas. Uh, <laughs> no, no. It could not be farther, <laughs> uh, more distant in many ways. But um, it, it, when places are your place, you, you get that feeling. So I was a teenager when we came to New York, and uh, the noise, the, I loved the subways, I loved the number of people, all the things that Texans most typically would tell you is what's wrong with New York City. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, and then out here, I, I love the light. Certainly. Oh, the light's incredible. We, I had Chris, Christina Strathfield was just on, and one of the yeah, things we ended up great. talking about was the light. Yeah. Uh, but she also talked about you because you were in the members exhibition that is, is still up. It's going yes. down um, the next Sunday. Correct. Uh, is, the, is the last showing. And she had a lovely piece of yours that she spoke about. And I think we have it too. So let's, let, let's show it again. Here, here it is. There we go. That's the bunny. The bunny. She really liked it. And um, she had an interesting take on, on some of the, the his, what, what she read into it. She saw an ominous quality in it with, that, with the boat in the background. There is a, a um, I don't actually understand these paintings myself, but there is definitely an unease to them. Um, the, I've been painting paintings related to this, which is water, ocean uh, images since I was in college. And the first ones were inspired by a single painting by Salvador Dali at the um, Huntington Hartford Museum at Columbus Circle. Which he has a lot of darkness in his work too, no? This was not well, he has a lot of foreboding. <laughs> you don't know if something bad's going to happen or not, right? I mean, although there's the ones that are clearly uh, uh -huh. hysterically um, horrible. But it, it opened up the whole mystery and particularly of what you aren't seeing with water. Um, so the, some of the paintings that we might, or one of the paintings in particular, we might see, there's actually a foot that's completely unexplained if you really start looking at the painting. And then there's the question of what it is it about those boats? And um, 
So there is mystery, and is it sinister or is it not? Is uh, an open question even for me after all these years. But when you say you don't mean, when you say you don't know what they mean, sometimes you feel like your subconscious is what brings this Absolutely. forward. Absolutely, yeah. And Classic surrealism. Mm -hmm. Yeah. If we had a different program, I'd talk about how I think surrealism is actually going to be considered the signature uh, art concept of the 20th century, that it permeates Everything. way more than what's called surrealism. So you think it's, a, it's, a, it's evident in everything? I do, and I think that, that particularly collage is inherently surrealistic, mm -hmm. and that collage is the, is the ultimate 20th century, um, down to wrapping and sampling. And, mm -hmm. you know, it, it's, uh, and you, you don't necessarily know what to make of it, but it, it like dreams, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. it's, uh, seems significant. It's certainly become a popular word, for sure. People like to use it. And it's making they, a they huge describe all their experiences as surreal. This is surreal. This is surreal. I almost get tired of hearing people tell me that this is surreal. I think <laughs> so that's, uh, yeah, I think that's going to go, uh, go away, partially because they're, they're using it incorrectly. Right. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> surreal doesn't mean weird. Although, right. Um, weird things can be surreal. Um, but, uh, yeah, we're having a fashion for that word, I think. At any rate, anyway, the so you you you've had a very fascinating career because not you're not just an artist you were you worked with Soho News and I did later Details Magazine a little bit but what's well you want to talk about Soho News let, let's go to your images I think that's a better okay let, let, let's talk we have what no what's this one okay so this is an image this was the uh, the Guild Hall I shouldn't be pointing at it the Guild Hall um, show this was a uh, honorable mention. Oh, and last year or this year? Or it was a couple of years ago. A couple of years yeah. ago. Yeah. So have you been in the Guildhall exhibition? Five or six years now. Oh, wonderful. It took me a very long time after I moved out here because I was so busy in my garden, I didn't get around to <coughs> painting, which was... Um, <coughs> you could take that image down while he's talking. Yeah. So... So you were, got busy in your garden because we wanted to talk about it. You, right. You're so all over the place. We've got... <coughs> got <coughs> Although me. it all makes sense to me. Yes. It always does, doesn't right. it? Yes. <laughs> um, the themes are the, the same themes. Um, going back to the images... When you say the themes are the, th are the same thing, what do you mean? Um, what, are, what are your themes? One of them is you, you hopefully, to provoke thought, um, as well as to be at least in some way beautiful um, and then there's layers of <sighs> source illusions if you will that I think all artists probably have things you saw you know it's like none of my paintings even slightly resemble that Salvador Dali painting <laughs> <laughs> but except it, but for it, there but was it, but it motivated you. there was o there was ocean and there were people who you could only partially see um, so there, for instance, with the painting we just saw, when people are floating like that, you don't see their legs, their feet. You don't know. There's, there's a kind of um, ambiguity about that situation, and particularly if it's a painting, because it's not real. Um, and I, it, that's kind of like what life is like, too. Um, we're floating and there's ambiguity. <laughs> You don't necessarily know what it means or um, what might happen, what happened just before or what happened next. But you only know what's in the happening in the moment. Exactly, yeah. So, <laughs> so, so let's so, surrender back to your painting. That we okay. Would, uh, which I, I kind of got you. Uh, so this is a, a later well, the one. one. before The one before, we didn't finish. The one, that, this one, is that, that was yes. the one honorable so, mention at Guild Hall. Right. So and this is gouache. The other uh, they, they, these paintings will go back and forth between gouache, which is a, a flat kind of watercolor, almost like poster paint, except for artists' poster paint, if you will. Mm -hmm. And then the others are oil paint. So the, the next one. The next one's an oil. Yeah, is an oil paint. And this is a big canvas or a little canvas? They are 24 by, this is 24 by 24 inches. All the square ones are because they were made specifically for the Guildhall show. Oh, okay, yes. And 25 inches in square is the maximum. So you can put a thin frame around 24 by 24. Mm -hmm. um, so this, one of the other themes, and I don't know, 
I can't explain this. This is, is fun. Zebras. This is a lot of fun. Is, is zebras. <laughs> you I really like zebras. You don't know what they, they, they they're They're black and white, I don't know. I actually have, it, it doesn't look like that one, but I actually have a, <clears throat> a zebra float that I have had for many years. Um, and finally I got grandkids to play with it. <laughs> but I had it for many years before then. Um, <laughs> So the so back to that painting. We don't understand it. Why any of it? And and it's is he supposed to be catching that ball that's in the air? Is it um, interestingly enough? There was another person in the original drawing who was missing, not catching the ball. And then I took her out and just decided to focus on him, um, <laughs> but left the ball. <laughs> Things happen at the beach, right? Well, it's all, I, th yeah. I find it's, it's interesting because it's all part of your process, right? It is. And it, these revived for me going back to the, the very first one, which there's a very funny story about. I painted in college and I did drawings. I, I painted a number of them, but the, the very first one that I still have, I painted in college. And then that came up for me again over the years. And then once I had a house out here, I was, uh, th those kinds, those types of images, um, really, it's the beach, you know? <laughs> this is what you see. Mm -hmm. um, and you, there's a lot of mystery at the beach, you know, and obviously um, a lot of artists out here, which Christina might have talked about, end up with their artwork either directly or indirectly referencing the, the beach and the ocean and the, the sky and the light. Um, so should I tell the funny story about the very first one of these paintings that I did that I still yeah. have? There were, there were several of them that were a series over a couple of it, years. This is the first painting that you did? With the person in the water. Okay. And this was in art school. Mm -hmm. And in art school we had a yearly sale. It was an auction, the art students auction. This is the University of Texas. Mm -hmm. There are 40,000 students mm -hmm. in those days. Now there are 60,000 students. And it was a big all-day event. And I was a known quantity as an art student. So there were literally other students who collected my work. What does that mean, known quantity? I, I, other students collected my work. Oh, okay. So you were, I sold I, in I'm galleries when not, I was in college. You were established. Yes, in local less. Austin, Texas galleries. Mm -hmm. and I was, uh, and At what age? I was 20. Or that, this particular story, I was 21. Oh, how fabulous. Um, oh, I continued after I moved to New York to sell in galleries in Austin for several years, in San Antonio for several years. Why'd you stop? <sighs> They were no business. Oh, <laughs> the natural. And reason. I did. Pr I was. I was a printmaker. I was a printmaking assistant. Uh -huh. I haven't done that in many, uh -huh. many years. But that was what I'd make here because it was easy, and you could uh, ship them back and forth. But back to this painting. So I sold something like thirty. I sold absolutely everything I had because I was moving to New York, and I needed some money, and I made sixteen hundred dollars, which would be around ten thousand dollars nowadays. Right. And I was thrilled by the whole thing. And then later, after I'm in New York, I um, keep regretting selling one particular painting. And thinking, well, why didn't, and I never regretted selling anything, but I was like, you know, I really wish I still had that. So, but what are you gonna do? I've been in New York for three years. I get a phone call. Guy on the other end says, are you the Michael Longacre who went to the University of Texas and is an artist? And I said, yes. And he said, well, I have this painting of yours and I bought it at the art auction. Would you want it back? Because I'm going to leave New York and I'm not taking anything with me. I'm changing my life completely. I was like, well, probably. And then he described it and it was the painting, the painting I regretted selling. <laughs> <laughs> did, you, did, you have, did he give it back to you or did you have to buy it back? Oh, no, he gave it back oh, to me. Oh, how fabulous. And he lived in a loft across the street on Fifth Avenue from the Flatiron Building in the 70s when that was a grimy, mm -hmm, gritty mm -hmm, neighborhood. Mm -hmm. And I was like, oh, this is interesting. I ultimately ended up doing a parody of Playboy magazine working in the Flatiron Building. Our offices were there. And so you were inspired by going there to get your painting? <laughs> no, but it was, it's that weird thing in New York City where you end up back in neighborhoods years later for different reasons. Oh, okay. And, and they are different. You know, they, many things have changed. Yeah. Although I've always lived below 14th Street, um, and including in Tribeca before people knew to call it that. And 
uh, the changes you know in that universe are so enormous. So, so let's, anyway, go, let's go back, back to, to images because mm -hmm. our time is going really yep. fast, believe it or not. So wh what is this one now? Um, this is the a version. Uh, this the, is oil again. Yes, this is oil, mm -hmm. and, and uh, you'll notice in this one, if you look very carefully, there's another red horse float. I see it much closer red. to the ship. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So the question of what is going on or <laughs> why. Yeah. We have another ominous little feature. Is it ominous or is it an escape, you know? Um, we don't know. <laughs> <laughs> we don't. Anyway, um, so that is a, a drawing that I actually did in the 80s that I, in my drawings that I pulled back out. That's that you then made a series of sketches off and on that I didn't execute as paintings. So you never, you, you keep everything and you keep morphing it and that's fabulous. I mean, that's, I think that's really cool. I think a lot of artists do this. Um, I think a lot of people do it but don't ever get back to like the, you've kept that sketch, and then I think a lot of artists keep that sketch and never do anything with it. They might. I, I think it's interesting <laughs> when the artist really does keep that sketch, and then many years later does something with it. I think too often it gets forgotten. That's my opinion. It I could be. be. I mean, but, you know, the 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 opposite example is Picasso, who went back and revived his own but, but work only makes every 10 or 15 it years. It kind of proves my point because Picasso is an exception to everybody. He is. <laughs> so, yes. But let's He's get back to your right work and not sure. my opinions. <laughs> so this is another gouache. Um, and this actually is faded. Unfortunately, one of the things about gouache is uh, you can't put it in a really bright sunlit room, oh. I discovered. Um, and here, once again, we have no idea what anybody's doing or why. <laughs> but... Um, but it's a snapshot. I mean, that's true in a lot of snapshots. Are, are all your paintings, are they all sketches before? Yes. Yes. Going pencil back sketches, to... Pencil sketches, pencil? Pencil on paper? Yes. So you add the color yes. as a thing that comes later too? Abs well, so going back to the history as an illustrator, um, once I started doing... So I was a painter. I worked as a temp typist to support myself. My wife did the same thing. We were like happy-go-lucky, and then we had a child. At which oh, point, boy. <laughs> I realized the sort of like, yeah, hey, we'll make the rent didn't still work. So that was when I decided to become a graphic artist and do graphic design, which I did. And is that when you went to Soho News or before Soho News? It was bef about a year and a half before. And then the Soho News thing, I started there just working on very small ads in the back mm -hmm. of the book, um, as it's called, where the classifieds. And within a year, I was the creative director. <laughs> Well, and there was both a lot of turmoil, and I could do whatever it was that needed to be done. Mm -hmm. And um, and I was doing illustration, et cetera, et cetera. In that process, and then I, I worked. So you got to do a little bit of everything then. That's oh, I wrote, and I was and ultimately also that's the managing really cool. editor. Yeah. So it's one of the things it really that gave you a lot of life experiences all at once too and uh, yes it, and, uh, it was it was a, you didn't get paid very much and sometimes you didn't get paid at all but it was um, a terrific amount of experience mm -hmm. and exposure mm -hmm. because although the circulation was only a third of what was claimed which and they only claimed 22,000 mm -hmm. so it was around six or seven thousand mm -hmm. everybody who was anybody in the arts or um, publishing read it David Bowie, it was his favorite publication. Mm -hmm. This came up um, after he died. So you got a lot of exposure. You got a lot of to experience. The, to, to a niche, to a really good niche. Yes, yes. And, and it was weekly. So yes. you were churning it out. You know, oh, you, you don't look bad. That's <laughs> what you do do. That teaches is, you a lot, doesn't it? <laughs> you, draw, you draw it in pencil, you ink it, and that's, that was all done you know, after 11 o'clock at night because you have to have it there tomorrow morning. And um, so in that process, I eventually developed a working on tracing paper. So I would, because it was mostly pen and ink that I did. Mm -hmm. um, and so I would draw the drawing and it would be close. Mm -hmm. And then, because I might do another one on tracing paper that was closer, but then I would do the ink on tracing paper because I could make my corrections as I did the inking. Mm -hmm. And when it was done, I'd glue the tracing paper down so it could be photographed as though, as it, because remember these things are only going to be reproduced. They're not, being, they're not being viewed for any reason. But that 
really created a make the sketch, work it out, put it on tracing paper, move on from there. And when I started doing gouache illustration, which is related to the, um, those gouache paintings, mm -hmm. then the tracing paper stage became the final drawing and that gets transferred to the paper. And it's almost like paint by numbers here. <laughs> uh, I really make very few changes once I'm on the canvas. Uh, although, every once in a while, the, the guy who's got the bulb that may be hitting well, it in the let's, head. Let's go, because we don't have much time and I'm running yeah. through your images. So yeah. was this where we left off? Was this? Yeah, this is the next one. This is also gouache. And this is the one where... We have about five minutes. Left yeah, over. this is the one where you'll notice it, there's actually, if you really look at it, that can't be her foot that is in the foreground of the painting. Um, there's somebody else that we don't know who it is in this painting um, who's completely underwater except right, for we can see their heel. Yeah. Um, which I think is fun. And this is just standard zebra painting. Stand uh, <laughs> <laughs> What'd you call it? Go back, go back, okay. go back. Standard, standard zebra painting. Oh, the, standard the zebra, zebra. Yes, I, the, the, I misunderstood the your zebra. zebra I'm float sorry. Uh, it comes up often in, in drawings. The next one, we can go to that too, is, is my garden. And part of why I, I chose this particular picture, other than I think it's beautiful and I love that stone, that boulder is twice as big as what you see. Half of it is submerged in the ground, <laughs> which relates to the images of you can't see the whole thing. It's partially obscured because it's, it, uh, it's, it's in this case, in the ground. In other cases, the stuff is in the water, and we don't know what else mm -hmm, is down mm -hmm. there. Yeah, that I had no idea when I bought the boulder that there was actually more of it under the ground than uh, what I was seeing. Um, so it was kind of startling when it arrived on a flatbed. <laughs> so, so you mean, you have, did, how did you not know? I mean, it was... It was, it was buried. It was buried and you, did, you had... Yes. No, this is, it was on display at Martyrs. How do you Martyrs. Boulder? How, uh, go to Martyrs. He has fabulous okay. boulders. They all come from upstate because uh -huh. they are... This is called schist. It's similar to granite. Um, and they part of the reason why it needs to be buried is that's how it was when it was found. So it's all rugged and, and cool in the part that's sticking out. Uh -huh. And the other side is kind of lumpy and because it, it's never been exposed. It was always underground. It's never been exposed so they have to different weather. Textures but it is the it. burying half hidden aspect that I was going to. So well, let's look at the last one. Okay, there's one more image? Yes, there is. There's the Surreal Hotel. Next, last image? Oh, no, this studio. <laughs> I was asked, do you have a picture of your studio? There it is. Got paintings in it. Ah. So this is Surreal Hotel, which is uh, after the Soho News. It went so out you of You can take it down. He's going to tell us a story yeah. about it. After the Soho But that is a pen and ink. So it, it relates to stuff that we talked about. Mm -hmm. uh, after the Soho News went out of business, the uh, part of the staff who were focused on fashion and the nightclub scene created Details Magazine, which ended up being a men's, men's fashion magazine after Condé Nast bought it. But it was originally a magazine for club kids. And it launched with no circulation except for your being on the list, which was of course, the um, right. could you get in? Uh, and there were people who, who actually begged, called and begged to be on the list. Part of that strategy was the fact that there was so little money we couldn't print very many of them. Mm -hmm. um, but so I was asked to do Surreal Hotel, which was a cartoon that I'd done as a strip, uh, panels that go along the bottom of In the Soho News, as a final page. And I did for several years. And um, it ultimately led to my working at Microsoft uh, because my future boss was, had the same lawyer as the woman who published the Soho News. He was waiting for his lawyer. He sees this weird publication. He looks at the back of it. He had just started being the editor of PC Magazine, which was the hottest magazine mm -hmm. in the United States, and um, wanted to do something fun about computers. So he asked me if I could do a similar thing about computers, which I did do, and I bonded with him and did design magazine design for him. And um, 
He also was very engaged when he heard that I was doing a parody of Playboy right at that particular moment when he called me. But um, he then and ultimately ended up at Microsoft and so did I. Which brings us back to so, how I have a house in Sagaponic <laughs> <laughs> and a garden and a studio. So the, the, all that came full circle to bring you here to the Hamptons, yes. to the great light, and where and the, we have yes. a history of renowned artists. Amazing so history, can, yes. Yeah. Uh, do, do you have something coming up that you're going to be doing? Uh, I really am. I work very slowly. Yeah, I don't have But you a, get back to it all, so you, you go full circle. It's really encouraging. I, I, yes, I have to stay alive to get this all finished. <laughs> but there is not a I can announce the, the upcoming show or anything. No, yeah, I'm really, I'm really reworking because there's an entire history that we haven't discussed, which is the abstraction. There's, there's a whole separate. We'll have to come back. Right. And, there's a whole separate wing of my artwork, which is abstract. Oh well, then you'll have to come back and talk about your abstractions. And, Happy to. Yeah. <laughs> I'd love to have you. Thank you, so, thank you so much for coming. And if you're not in your garden, I'm sure we'll find you in the studio, huh? <laughs> right. Or out and about. I, I do see you guys pretty often in the summer. Good. So, so we'll, we'll, we'll see you at, at Guild Hall, I'm sure, or Bay Street. or Absolutely. One, one of those wonderful places that we have out here in the summer. But we have theater going on in the summer. I just relearned, I guess I'd known this, that Sybil Burton was the person who started Bay Street. Sybil Christopher. She was by then, but <laughs> <laughs> I lived in New York when she, she had a nightclub. <laughs> oh, yes. I, I remember that nightclub, <laughs> Arthur's. Yes, yes, that was a dynamite little spot. Yes, I'm sure she left all that behind and, and et cetera, et cetera. But. Yeah, she, she founded that wonderful place called Bay Street. Thank you so much Thank for you. coming. We're, we're, believe it or not, we're all out of time. It's, it's gone really fast. <laughs> I'm very talkative. <laughs>